Don't worry, John. You don't have to dance for this part. <laughs> but if you come back, then there will be choreography. <laughs> nice. mm-hmm. Shout out Roxy. We love this song. <laughs> oh, Roxy's so good. She's a great performer, too. She, yeah, I heard her sing live. Yeah. She's beautiful, talented, amazing. Roxy, get it. Hi, guys. Welcome to a brand new episode of Behind the Mask, the podcast where you will learn everything you need to know before having plastic surgery because the more you know the better you look right dr william that's true i'm gabby allen your host here with the one the only dr william how are hey, you feeling gabby. today i'm good how are you doing i'm good too i'm fired up i'm uh, we always are right yeah, i'm really fired up we don't I, even have our coffee on the table right now no we've, we've got it. this liquid death yes giving us liquid life right yeah that's true <laughs> guys welcome back today we have a very very special guest we are joined by john sinclair you have a pretty extensive background um let's see if i can touch on it a bit you have been coaching um, uh, for more than 20 years, you are a sports engineer, health coach, and you've worked with some pretty impressive brands, including Nike. You've worked with the Minnesota Vikings, the 76ers. I mean, to my understanding, you're all about movement and motion. And um, can you fill in whatever I haven't covered? Yeah, so um, I'm the director of programming for the Institute of Motion. Mm-hmm. Um, we're a company that delivers education, consulting. Uh, we help develop products um, underneath that company. We developed a product called Viper Pro which is a product for actually training fashion and doing movement related training. So um, as that, as a consultant, we also work with governments, help supply information and technology and kind of mindset around how to improve their health in their, in their country. Um, So yeah, it's, it's a fun job. I get to hang out in my short pants all day (laughs) down here in South Florida. I'm originally from Canada. Yes. Another down here eight years ago. Yes, I know. That's why uh, one of the reasons why we had them on, I've got to get more Canadians. on. I know. And I hear you're an Oilers fan, which we will forgive. We will forgive for the next um, hour or so. Well, you worked uh, for the Oilers, right? Yeah. I worked with the Oilers organization uh, for a couple of years as the strength and conditioning coach for their development system. Mm Mm-hmm. So worked with the Edmonton Roadrunner or the Toronto Roadrunners first, and then they moved to Edmonton during the lockout and became the Edmonton Roadrunners during the year of the lockout. So he's he's uh, qualified. Okay, fine. Yeah. We'll, ex- <laughs> we'll accept it for now. By the Thank end of this, you will be saying "Go Cats." That's yeah. my goal. <laughs> Deal. Yeah. So um, I'm going to circle back because you did uh, hit a key term there. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about and uh, kind of just give us a very simple explanation about the fascia fascia okay fascia. so uh, fascia is the easiest way to explain is that it's our support organ mm-hmm. okay so when i was going to university i was um taking gross anatomy classes so we were dissecting humans and this was back in uh, 1995 or 96 i think i took that first class and back then you would dissect somebody and you would just get beneath the layer of the skin look at the connective tissue and try to see the muscle because being in a physical education background, we're looking at, okay, what do muscles do? And then, and that, so back in 95, we would kind of cut through the fascia and we would just take it away and throw it in a bucket. (laughs) There was no real thought about it because there wasn't a lot of education at the time and research around that connective tissue. We knew it was connective tissue, but we didn't really understand how it behaved. And now since then, um, and I can't remember exactly the year it happened, but um, fascia is now considered an organ of the body. And so it, if we understand how it behaves and we understand how to influence it and we understand how it communicates to the rest of the body, then now we have a greater capacity for understanding its role and how important that role is because it's a massive role in, in not only just movement, but how it supports us. Everything in the body is surrounded by fascia. Mm-hmm. Every single cell is surrounded by fascia. So uh, we have to think about it. One of the things that kind of caught me uh, off guard is basically bone itself is fascia. Mm-hmm. It's just calcified fascia. And so if we think of it from that perspective, wow, if our whole body is made up of this supporting organ or all this connective tissue, it has to have a pretty big role. You skin think, has to have yeah. a pretty big role. Because if skin is one of our largest, heaviest organs, it would behoove us to know a little bit about it because we're carrying this really heavy bag around with us when <laughs> yeah. we're moving, yeah. playing hockey, playing sports, mm-hmm. doing all our activities. So um, as it relates to 
movement, what I do as a practitioner, a coach, or strength and conditioning coach, is we have to look at the role that it plays in aiding us in movement and mm-hmm. making us more efficient and economical. Mm-hmm. So then, um, where, how does fascia meet faha? How do well, they come together? I mean, I, I wanted to have John a little bit of background because John didn't, you mm-hmm. know, just appear. He obviously, he's <laughs> super knowledgeable, very well educated, very skilled, super experienced. Um, I originally uh, came across John through uh, an injury to one of my sons. He tore his anterior cruciate ligament, which can be a very devastating uh, injury for athletes. And you hear of athletes re-tearing their ACLs, and you know you see them wearing braces and things like that. And I just I didn't want to have that for my son. I wanted to repair his ACL. But, uh, and then, you know, have him return to normal. Sure. But I knew that was a huge ask and a very tall challenge. challenge. Um, but um, my son, who did tear his ACL, has a, has a phenomenal work ethic. I mean, he's a machine. And uh, after he had his surgery, he went to rehab, but we kind of got to, to PT, and we kind of got to that point where the physical therapist is like, okay, well, he's, I mean, he's the type of kid who would show up early, start his own exercises, yeah. you know, and was very motivating. He's like, listen, I think your, your son would benefit now from moving on to kind of the next level, and I have an expert that we know, mm-hmm. and is not covered by medical insurance. He's, he's a trainer, but mm-hmm. he's he's got some pretty amazing credentials and so then we had the gunner go and meet with john and that's where everything started then john actually started training my boys and through that we started just kind of talking and i realized like wow this is like a diamond in the Mm -hmm. rough because this is not just someone who's trying to get your money to to put your kids through exercises that they're too lazy to do on their own Mm -hmm. like this is actually someone that's going to work with um your kids and educate them and you know that obviously for me what i do struck a chord and then just in our own personal conversations talking about fascia well fascia is like super important as a surgeon Mm -hmm. because if we do a tummy tuck we're not sewing together the muscles that's what people call it but we're sewing together the fascia okay the fascia has the strength Mm -hmm. uh the muscle if you put a stitch in it and pull it it'll just tear it's really not strong mm-hmm. at all. It's the fascia that gives the support. And so as a surgeon, I've known that for since day one, You start, we start talking about scarpus fascia, which is a little smaller fascial layer that lives in between you know, skin, fat, and then you have the scarpus. So even when we close a tummy tuck, we're taking bites, sutures, of the fascia because that's where the strength mm-hmm. uh, comes. So when I heard John start talking about fascia and the myofascial interface and the role of it, I was like, wow, this is really interesting to mm-hmm. me. Your ears perked right up. Yes, <laughs> I thought this is really interesting. And then uh, what, I w- what I really want to get from him is – what, what I experienced with my with my he was very different than with my kids because you think of like a lot of trainers like push 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 you know more mm-hmm. more more harder harder do all these types of things mm-hmm. one more and everything but my kids were like wow John's like really different he gives us time to rest in between mm-hmm. now they still come home occasionally pale nauseated <laughs> uh, you know like they're gonna throw up and they yeah. have thrown up at his yeah. place and and you know he drives them very hard but. What I was fascinated with is was his knowledge and understanding and recognition of the recovery phase. Yeah. And they even have recovery workouts with him. They even have pre-workouts with him before games mm-hmm. and things like that. And so I thought, wow, this is interesting. We need to talk about this because the fascia, the dovetail between, you know, devices after uh, surgery, the so lymphatic things, mm-hmm. we, you know, talked about with candy um that really fits well with what he does in this whole different concept of what recovery actually is right and so we've heard that from a point of view where you have surgery and then how important recovery is and then exercise and how important recovery is and and i just don't know that that's as well known right so so I, I, what I, that's how it kind of fits together. Mm-hmm. I would love to know, before we get into the nitty-gritty details about the fashion and everything else, mm-hmm. just kind of give us your 
philosophy or tell us, explain to us why recovery is so important um, because I think it really translate well, translates well to the recovery from surgery. Mm -hmm. So can you just talk about all that? Sure. Just Yeah, recovery basically fits under the umbrella of preparation, right? And so if, if we think of anything that we're going to do in sport or we're doing in our life, there's a psychological preparation to it. There's a physical preparation to it. There's a mental, emotional, there's a cognitive side to it. We're all preparing for something. Now, depending on the work that we put in, and, and we're very well aware of what work can be done. I mean, the fitness industry has done an mm -hmm. excellent job of talking about this is how you put work in. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, don't do a good of programming it or organizing it or mm -hmm. structuring it into a business. In a lot of cases, they've not done the best job of doing that. And mm -hmm. we can get into that later if anyone wants to rant about the fitness industry. I love doing <laughs> that. But the challenge is balancing out that work with recovery. And so I call it working out and working in. And they have to have a balance because in order for any tissue to adapt, the nervous system to adapt, the muscular system to adapt, we need to have a balance or a homeostasis. We learned that in grade 10 biology, right? Mm -hmm. Like homeostasis is creating a balance. So mm -hmm. adaptation, the species can thrive. At the level of the cellular level, it's the same thing. So at the cellular level, there's a signaling system that basically programs live or die, mm -hmm. right? So we've got growth and we've got death. Recovery is about if I've put in a level of stress, recovery helps balance that stress out. So if we look at the nervous system, the nervous system is if I work out really hard, I'm challenging the sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. In order to recover it, I got to decrease the sympathetic nervous system and raise the parasympathetic nervous system. Tissue is the same way. If I load a tissue, right, it's going to be stressed. I need to be able to take some of that stress away and I need to be able to enhance its normalcy or getting it back to a normal level so that the cells can do what they need to to repair and actually to create uh, either more cells and or become stronger cells and then get rid of the cells that aren't. So your your recovery, if I take this right, is as important, you, your work in is, is as important as your workout. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So the amount of stress that we put on an individual needs to be balanced out. And it doesn't need to be balanced out in that particular workout. But how we engineer performance and how we engineer health is making sure that the stress we put in is offset by the stress that we take away so that or better way of looking at it is putting in a positive or a you stress to the distress that we've created. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you I may mean, need to program my whole life <laughs> and choices <laughs> to well, balance that, out the stress. That makes a lot of sense. And specifically, like after my kids started working out with you, then all of a sudden Amazon was delivering all of these foam rollers, <laughs> uh, rolling devices, vibrational devices, and they were plugged in all over my house. <laughs> and my I would come home and my kids were in my garage and I couldn't park my car because they were all like rolling. rolling around I, I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> like they, they, they almost every day, they're, you know, they're in college now, but almost every day when they were there, somebody was on some device at some point mm -hmm. and they learned that from you. Yeah. So t tell us what, what are they treating? What are they doing? Who should be doing it? How often should be doing it? How does it work? Give me the whole, the whole skinny on that, yes. uh, the whole recovery, at least that part of the recovery sure. I'm really interested in. Cause I think that pertains to the fascia, right? hundred percent. Yeah. So, um, Whatever stress we put into the body, we have to realize that the entire system, the human body system, is completely integrated. You can't isolate any particular thing mm -hmm. in the body. So if we talk about, oh, we're going to train your abs, well, you're training your abdominal wall, but not only your abdominal wall, there's other things going on there. Yeah. The same thing if we try to recover a particular area of the tissue. Now, what's cool about foam rolling or using devices is that it does a number of things. Number one and probably first and maybe the most important is that it creates pressure changes in the tissues that create circulation. And so we can't heal the body without circulation, right? And so we use compression. So rolling is a form of compression. If I get you to put push your finger down onto your hand and we use that compression in that tissue and you let go, fluid's gonna move back to that area. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm pushing fluid through the body as 
well, I am. I'm pushing fluid and moving that through through the tubules in the in the tissues. But when I release that compression, fluid rushes back. So mm-hmm. it's those pressure changes that are creating some really groovy things at the chemical level that is telling the body to help recover. So we have compression that if I put pressure on tissue, that moves fluids. Makes sense, right? You turn your garden hose on, you step on the garden mm-hmm. hose, you take your foot off, and the garden hose expands. And yeah. And stuff runs back through it. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing as when you put pressure. So anytime I'm using pressure or friction, those are different forces that move fluids through the body. So if um, do we ever room to stand up? Or is yeah, sure. Yeah. Do whatever stand you like. Up. Go so for it. Let's I want stand. You to do this for okay, me, let's okay? do so it. So we're going to use friction and oh, compression. It's, it's cold in here. <laughs> to enhance movement. So what I'd like you to do for me is I'm gonna, you're going to take your hands and you're going to scrub your knee. So my hands. You're going to do this. You're going to go. I want you to do that just on one knee. Do that just on one knee as hard as you can. Okay, and we're gonna do that for about 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, and so what she's doing is she's using friction and compression at the same time on either side of the knee. Now, if you have room, squat up and down and tell me you feel different on your left than your right. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so all we did is we used two different forces. We used compression, creating a pressure change. We used friction to drive heat to that tissue. Yeah. And then as soon as you move, what happens is the joint actually creates lift. So if I drive fluids to a, to a particular joint or in, into any tissue, mm-hmm. you're going to create a change in, it's called a hydraulic amplifying effect, or basically it's creating space in a joint, right? So that's all we did, is I drove fluid to that area, mm-hmm. it did this for you, and then it put the joint in that's called, fancy terms, instantaneous yeah. uh, axis of rotation, which gave your joint the space it needed to move did, did into you feel that a difference space. yeah absolutely are you saying that just no saying no, no that? it did it felt looser it felt easier yeah. like it was not you, as tight in yeah, that try that spot. at home because it's one of the the funny little tricks i do with every person uh that i come in contact with of how to explain what recovery and what m- uh, creating circulation can do to enhance a joint so that's what anybody that's with body. uh Compression, compression does and, the same thing, uh, fr- and friction. And friction is what she was using there. You got it. So, what if we're massaging a what we deem a muscle, right? So, if I'm rolling up and down on the front of my thigh, yeah, we would say that's muscle, right? But it's also skin. Yeah, it's fascia covering that muscle. Yes. And then, of course, you've heard the IT band. Like that's never very comfortable, right? Yeah. Because if we rub the IT band. The reason why the IT band gets so tender and so sore from putting that much pressure on it is it is a massive band of fascia. Yeah. So well, what it's we the haven't thickest, talked, biggest you band in you your body. It. Yeah. So what we didn't talk about is the communication network. So the first thing is circulation. The second thing is how it communicates back to the body. To the fascia. The fascia. Yeah. So it receives information faster than the nerve can get information from the brain. So it'll receive information almost 10 times faster than the nervous system. So it detect it's basically a sensory organ. Right? Yeah. So it detects force. Because it it's wrapping pressure. all of your muscles. It's wrapping everything. Yeah. But at uh, the cellular level, they communicate back to the nervous system faster than the nervous system can communicate back. So if you've got a really massive band of tissue and you're massaging it and, it's, and it hurts, it's because you're introducing so much information. Mm-hmm. The brain receives that as, oh, that's kind of painful. I don't know if I should be doing that. So we go strategically with different devices to delay that response. That's where vibration comes in. I can put vibration into that area or a massage gun, which is percussion, it's not vibration, Mm -hmm. but I can use a percussion gun Mm -hmm. so that every time I'm hitting a tissue and I'm moving a different spot, it's getting different information to the cellular system. It's like, if I hit my head like this for three or four minutes, it's gonna start to get sore there. But if I do this for three or four minutes, it's not gonna hurt too much, right? So the idea behind um, recovery and using recovery devices is it'll improve circulation, mm-hmm. which is what we need for healing to right. occur. We of need course. to exchange fluids. Yes. You know, um, Candy was talking about the lymphatic system, right? Yeah. The lymphatic system doesn't function without circulation. Right. We need to move fluids. Yeah. So we can do that through movement. We can use that, do that through devices. Because it's a very low pressure system. Right. And then we influence with either um, devices for circulation and for communication, for telling the nervous system, hey, everything's safe, right? If I have somebody that has pain, you know, you smash your shin on the coffee table, what do yeah. you do? What's your first? You rub it. You rub it, why? Because you're oh, telling I'm the sensory <laughs> system, it's, it's okay, it's safe. Everything's okay, it sucks. Gabby just uh, punches a hole in the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's only on the weekends. <laughs> 
So those are the two real big ones. And then, and you know, we could dive down a deeper rabbit hole of what's actually occurring at the cellular level. Let's, but let's take, let, let's, so, uh, oh, I just, I get so excited with, with <laughs> If you guys are confused, do what I did. Do a quick Google image search for the fascia and then it'll just give you a better visual mm -hmm. on everything they're going into. Or you can just pretend like you fully understand like I do sometimes. <laughs> well, fa I mean, fascia is, it is kind of a nebulous, um, I mean, when I was teaching medical students uh, how to close wounds and things, um, you know, you have to point out to them what is the fascial layer. And sometimes in the skin, it's a little bit more difficult to see. Um, but a lot of times you can feel it. So you mm -hmm. can grab it with your instrument and you can tug it. And, yep. you know, when, it, when a student is learning to suture, they may put the stitch through the fat and then think that they're doing a good job, then you pull that and it just tears right through mm -hmm. and you explain, okay, this is the fascia. So the fascia I think is kind of much talked about, but it is a little bit nebulous, so it is kind of harder to picture. Mm -hmm. The way I describe it, this is not actually anatomically correct, but I think it gives people a visual. Mm -hmm. If you eat spare ribs and that little membrane mm -hmm. that you can kind of pull off, that's actually not uh, fascia, that's pleura, but it's similar concept. It gives you the idea of what it is. It's a distinct layer. But so, John, you brought up the, the cellular level or the fascia, and you know maybe it's going to bore everyone to death. But you and I are, are like really interested in this stuff. <laughs> no, it's not boring. See, for me, somebody who um, I've never had plastic surgery, um, I consider myself a very active person. Like I'm constantly looking for ways, you know, to yeah, you better work out my a lot. yeah. yeah. yeah you know, whether, you know, through exercise or, you know, through walls, but um, trying to better my recovery and mobility. These are things that definitely help, I think, even yielding positive results and then healing through um, surgical procedures as well. Yeah. What, what, is, so what's going on at that muscle uh, fascial, the myofascial, that interface, if you're rolling it? Okay. So, so what does that do for you? Talked about the circulation mm -hmm. there and that's, there's pressure. And then the rolling is is has it must have a lymphatic role, hundred percent. So but anytime tell us your what's going on there. So anytime you increase circulation, you're going to increase lymphatic flow, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of the lymphatic system is move waste through the, through the tissues yeah. and back into its system, so the body can bring nice fresh fluid back to that area. Yeah, new nutrients. Yeah. So if I can create more nutrients in in that particular tissue, then that tissue is going to recover. It's going to adapt. We also get a big flush of hormones that come to that area. So there's a whole chemical level of hormones that are going to be flooded to a particular area based on pressures and movement, right? So the more we move, the better our circulation. So if I'm, if I'm prescribing exercise as a strategy for healing, one of the main goals is to improve circulation right off the bat. That's why, you know, if you go, hurt your knee and you go to the physical therapist, one of the first things they're going to have you do is in increase heat to bring fluid to that area, mm -hmm. use ice to help remove that fluid, mm -hmm. get you moving it in a, in a circular motion and or in a cyclical motion so that we can keep enhancing circulation. When we put pressure on a tissue, there's a not only just a change in what's happening circ from a circulation standpoint, but there is information that's going to that tissue that we call mechanotransduction. Mm -hmm. Mechanotransduction is a big fancy term for taking mechanical energy, converting it into chemical activity yes. to create change. Yes. Right? And I have so, a degree in cell biology. This is like uh, music to my ears. So I'm like on the edge of my seat. <laughs> I don't know seat. the words to this song, <laughs> yeah. but um, I'll learn music. But, but, the, so, but your point <laughs> is what you're doing in recovery when you're actually physically, mechanically applying a rolling device, a uh, percussion yep. device, yep. something, is that energy is being transferred into an actual chemical reaction yes. that is is now actually instructing it's your instructing body the to carry to something out. To do something out. You got it. So what are they doing? So the cell itself, depending on the pressure that you put into it, will receive that energy. And then when that cell changes... Um, and receives that chemical activity, there's a host of messengers that that are involved in carrying out the next thing, right? And so for recovery or for tissue to recover, then we've got lots of information being sent to uh, hormones, 
um, collagen is being driven to that area. So um, if you're at a Wolf's Law, Wolf's Law is if I break a bone, I need to stimulate more yeah. cells to be able to build more bone. Right. right. So that's a that's a scientific law. Yeah. As bone relates, heals with bone stress. Bone heals with stress. Yeah. Tissue heals with stress. Mm-hmm. And that's called Davis's Law. So I need to stress that tissue so that collagen can go to that mm-hmm. fibrous area because <coughs> fascia is made up of basically fibers, extracellular matrix, um, sugar molecules, and... Um, And we want to try and drive as much chemical activity so that more fibers can go to that tissue and it can lay itself down. Well, let me ask you then, what about my broken bone? Yeah, so your broken bone. Even though it's it's stuck in this brace, then what would be, you know, to enhance that circulation and healing? Yeah, we got to move it. (laughs) That's not what the doctor said. I know. (laughs) What kind of movement? What's the Well, you have to immobilize it. We don't want to have one with a fracture moving their bone. You have to immobilize it so that... The, the two ends can, yeah. but, but but there's a reason why your fingers are still available to yeah. create motion. Yeah. Yeah. This is segmentally stabilized. Mm-hmm. This is distally allows you to move. Mm-hmm. So even if you grab your other forearm mm-hmm. and you put your hand around it mm-hmm. and you do this, can you feel movement on yeah. the bone? Yeah. yeah. So that's going to drive circulation to that area. That's okay. why they don't, you know, close off your fingers. Yeah. Right. If you, mm-hmm. th- if this was too tight and this was too closed mm-hmm. off, we'd lose circulation and a lot of that tissue would die. So let me ask you too. Um, like my doctor told me I'm not allowed, I should not lift anything more than like four or five pounds for this time. Have I followed that fully? Maybe, maybe not. What kind of damage then can maybe too much stimulation or kind of, you know, you know hitting a point of like too much pressure, or too much movement, then it becomes like a negative. Yeah, that's a great question because meta- mechanotransduction is is all about receiving forces. Mm-hmm. You said you were not going to say that word, mechanotransduction. It's one of my favorite words in the world. Say it again, ASMR. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about magnitude of force, mm-hmm. uh, direction of force. Okay. So where's that force coming from? And then where's that force being applied? So an easy way to say is, well, don't lift about four pounds because that's a that's a quantifiable mm-hmm. uh, yeah. amount that we can think about, mm-hmm. right? But the reality is, if I give you a, a four pounds of force in this direction, mm-hmm. that's a completely different line of pull mm-hmm. on the tissue, which affects how that connective tissue attaches to the bone, okay. which means how that bone's going to heal. Oh, if I give you four okay. pounds of force in this direction, it's the same basically point of application, Uh but a different vector. So now I've changed where that line of force is going through the tissue, which influences the The cells in this area to lay down collagen to protect and to heal that tissue. So just because I can, I shouldn't. (laughs) Well, Well, it all depends on the magnitude. Right, right. right. So it's how much force can that tissue Mm -hmm. tolerate? Mm -hmm. And that's really, you know, when Gunnar tore his ACL, Mm early on he can't tolerate a ton of force through that fascia ligament the acl is all fascia Mm. it just has a different um proportion of collagen to reticulum to elastin that's found in that tissue versus fascia that's beneath the skin has a different composition you know i've never thought of it that way that that's fascinating that that ligament is ligament is i mean they're all made they're all building blocks right your body's made up of of the same stuff it's just but the constituent parts are in different different amounts yeah like tendon acts differently than ligament right yeah totally different uh the fascia and the abdominal wall acts differently than all of those three well here's here's something that is relates to what i do based on what you said with this Mechanical transduction. Is that what you call it? Mechanical Mechano transduction. Mechanical yep. transduction. Yeah. So, and this really uh, pertains to wound healing and for what I do, scar how scars heal. Yep. So, um, I don't know if you know this, but because you're not, di- well, maybe you are, I guess, with your injuries and in helping injured athletes mm-hmm. and whatnot with scars. Mm-hmm. But the way wounds heal, the way scars mature, is by replacing that fetal collagen with adult collagen. So it's going, you know, taking out the fetal and putting in the adult. And if you massage it, if you physically put pressure on it, it reorganizes the fibers that are wow. there, the collagen bundles. And there's this has been well known and, and um, I don't know, whatever those uh, micron, um, scanning electronic micro, um, Whatever. You know those images where you can see like the bundles of the fibers. I mean, there's been so many pictures of that done where you have an untreated wound 
uh, untreated incision, the scar, compared to one that's been massaged. And the one that's been massaged has got everything lined up. Yep. And and that is the essence of Davis's law. And that's the that, collagen yeah, will lay down never, along the lines of stress you provide it. Yes. So massage, what Candy's doing, if, if she's massaging um, scar tissue, is as she's massaging that scar tissue, it is going to organize those fibers, right? So that they lay down this way, so that it now becomes a functional bit of tissue. If I've got scar tissue that's moving yeah. all over, then guess what? Force can't transmit through that scar. Yeah, it has to move around it. It's all unorganized. Yeah. So we want to try and create a functional element to that scar tissue. And that's why it's even at this at the skin level, we need to be able to move that around because the skin aids in our movement. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, w you know, people always want the best scars. We want the best scars. And we're, we're coming out with something that's uh, a scar gel. And I don't want to make this episode all about that. But mm -hmm. the two things that are, that are involved with that is going to be a rolling device so that we're able to put that mechanical pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to have some vibrational technology as well to try to get all of those fibers to line up and do it. And the way I think of it, and I've thought about this way for years, is, you know, what makes, if you look at the body, I mean, if I do, say, an upper blepharoplasty with I remove some skin from your, your upper eyelid, it heals completely different than if I remove a mole on your back. Your back scar will be worse. Mm -hmm. So different parts of the body will heal differently. And I've always thought, you know, if you look just, let's say your hands, you, you typically don't get like a bad scar over a joint. You, you tend to get bad scars over areas that are immobile, they're not moving. So I've always thought, because I know this whole mechanical transduction thing where the pressure will affect what the cells are doing mm -hmm. and the cells are trying to get you the best scar mm -hmm. not because they think oh this i'm had a tummy tuck i need the best scar but they're trying to get you the best scar from a functional point of view because we have our bodies for a long period of time they get injured they need to heal and they need to keep functioning yeah. so the joints always have great scars because your body is moving and that movement so i've always thought well when we massage a scar we're just tricking the body so if you have a scar you know here where this is not a joint it's not moving but if we're applying the massage it thinks oh i'm over a joint mm -hmm. i need to line up so that i can you know not in in influ in negatively impact the function mm -hmm. so have you heard about have you thought about that yeah, or heard 100%. about that before because what i think I might it makes sense to me also say is that you know like all these tissues that we don't observe moving there are layers of tissues that are moving underneath it yes right and so if i cut through many different layers of it if it scars all, we'll say willy nilly, it just mm -hmm. kind of goes all over. Higgly piggly. Higgly <laughs> piggly. Like this Canadian term. <laughs> They've dropped a few already. Yeah. Uh, then what happens is that that tissue doesn't want to slide all that well. And so our skin is actually quite a big mover of the body. I mean, if you've watched someone that's um, extremely overweight or obese run, Don't and get you have them on a, I'm not. And then you go into a slow motion video, you'll see their connective tissue is moving on their body. That is changing the angulation of the joint, right? So if I have a scar on your skin that isn't maybe a prime mover of a joint, yeah. it still influences mitigation of force. Ah. So how our body receives force, right? So if, if um, you know, a good one to compare is like an old hip replacement. You know, where they like, they cut, your incision was like that long yeah. in order to get to the femur and right. then they put the rod in your right. femur and stuff. Well, they lost a lot of frontal plane motion. So being able to move even just subtly in that frontal plane motion because the force couldn't go through that scar, right? And it wasn't, they were so concerned with the joint moving and, and establishing range of motion of observable movement that we forgot about wow what actually happens when we when we try to move that skin it gets really adhered to and then you massage around it it's quite painful yes right is because now i've got all these layers of skin that are adhered and or glued down yeah it's just a funny term no, no, for like just dehydrated stuck. fascia yeah right and if i can't get water into that tissue that tissue won't slide and move and that's essentially what layers of fascia do they slide and move so that we can receive forces from the ground that are driven by gravity um, and 
dictate how we move. Muscles have always been given like, I think maybe because the they were pretty, they were given yeah. priority and we always talked about them as being like, Muscles this is this is the most important thing. <laughs> the problem is that um, we've also thought, we don't really think this quite so much anymore, that muscles are what move us. And it's not true. Gravity moves us. The connective sh- tissue stores that energy mm-hmm. and then sends information back to the brain and then the brain coordinates, well, what's my task? What am I trying? Am I walking from here to there? Mm-hmm. Am I picking up this can of water? Mm-hmm. Am I throwing stuff into the back of my truck? Your brain organizes that. But what tells it to do that is actually gravity and ground reaction force. And that's how we receive that mechanical energy from the ground, right? So if you lay in bed all the time and try to exercise from bed, you're not gonna feel very well because we haven't received any ground reaction force. So that's why rest. I gotta well, change my workout plan. <laughs> so oh, no. that's why rest <laughs> in in the short term is really good. Yeah. But after that, we gotta get things moving. Yeah. When we're trying to heal. T- talk this is to fascinating. Me, it it is really is a, an interesting subject. Talk to me about um, the uh, the vibration a little bit more. Sure. In terms of what what's that? What else is it doing? Yeah. Or uh, is it vibration or like verse percussion? Yeah. Or would this great. be the same so thing? So th- two different things. Mm-hmm. Um, at the cellular level, we are all vibrating at a certain frequency. Mm-hmm. So all cells in good the body. Vibes. Good mm-hmm. vibes. Good vibes. Yeah. Only. <laughs> you know. Uh, those good vibrations as the beach boys said like they are always operating a certain frequency if we introduce a device that brings vibration into the body that's accelerating that that cellular activity through vibration you've now changed the frequency or your body's receiving that information as a change in frequency that's a good thing because that stimulates chemical activity Mm -hmm. like almost immediately so that's bringing all of those healing factors basically that that's why we're using these vibrational technologies in phases of recovery yeah and there's different types of vibration right if you operate a jackhammer that's a mechanical form of vibration Mm -hmm. but it's it's a non-harmonic vibration because it's all dictated by when that hammer hits the ground and comes back at you, uh-huh. right? So how your body receives that force is very, is we say is non-harmonic. It's not a normal frequency that yeah. happens at the cellular erratic. level. You got it. Um, but if I use something that has a set frequency to it, such as um, I use power plate, I think it's the, the premier device for vibration training yeah. in the world. When you use that that has a set frequency and a harmonic uh, frequency to it, um, it accelerates not only circulation, but the body starts to sense what that vibration is and the cells now orientate themselves to that vibration. So have you, have you ever seen those um, videos where you have uh, someone put sand on a plate and they add vibration to the table? Mm-hmm. And those those things now change the orientation that comes out into an image. Yeah. Well, all objects are subservient responders to force and vibration is a force. So whatever vibration I put that into is going to change in whatever's touching it, Mm. right? And so that's what's kind of cool about it is that based on different frequencies, we can input the amount of force measured in acceleration, not in mass, but we can receive that information and turn it into something that the body can receive as information. So it's not only just creates the mechanotransduction to create the chemical activity, mm-hmm. but also creates a sensory response, which means the brain has to interpret it, that as well. So you're operating on a different component of the body, helping to not just the cellular, but in, in the muscle and the fascia, but your nerves get involved. 100%, yeah. yeah, the nerve has to receive, I mean, because even at the sensory level, there there's a motor response to every sensory information that we get, right? So we say it's normally top down, so it starts vestibular in the brain and works its way down to the distal ends of touch, Mm -hmm. right? But pressure and heat and all those things influence it. So if I use pressure with rolling and vibration, well, I've got two sensory responses the brain has to interpret, but then also tells the nervous system, cool, we can rest and digest and we can uh, enhance healing to occur, right? If I'm always in a stressed, you know, Try doing a rehab when you're in a really stressed out mm-hmm. environment or try to get on a massage table and enjoy your massage when you're freaking out about stuff. Yeah. It's not going to happen, right? So all that communication and that interpretation determines the outcome that we want. So that's why I try not to, 
when I work with somebody for the first time, I try not to do anything too abrasive right off the bat. So I'll go and I'll use friction on a joint like I did with Mm -hmm. you. So if I can gain your trust by doing something that's really simple, that's easy to do and very memorable. You're going to remember that whole, hey, if I oh, need I'm to Oh, I'm going to do that better, before my next lower body workout. I'm going to warm up it. all the joints. You got it. I'm going to squat twice as much. <laughs> well, you probably won't, but you'll feel twice as, as though many. you have more space yes, to there be able you go. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. John, this is absolutely I know, I'm learning so much. And um, I think now might be a good time to take a little pause, sure. segue for a moment. Um, it's time for a different segment. And um, we've got some questions for you guys today. It's coming from Instagram. Oh, hang on, the grams get a question. And here is the question. This is from Melanie, thanks Melanie. Um, now, this can be for both of you, a collaborative answer maybe. Um, will butt exercises, um, will that make you lose the fat grafted after surgery? Well, I can, t- you don't do any fat grafting, do you? <laughs> Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> um, fat grafting, and, th- and this is a whole nother area I wanna get into. Mm-hmm. Um, just to take advantage of your 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 training techniques, um, so I'm a big proponent of exercise for patients who've had BBLs and to strengthen the muscle, but they're completely separate. So if you, as long as you maintain your weight, your butt is not going to disappear. The fat is not going to go away simply by doing exercises. Mm-hmm. It's the exact opposite. You're going to improve the shape of your butt by doing all those types of things. Give us like a quick little small, John's like me, all of his answers are long. No, I like it. Um, because he's really detailed and mm-hmm. passionate. But give me a quick, I don't know, couple minute, what would you do to increase the gluteal area to make your butt look better after you've had a BBL? What can you do from an exercise point of view? Okay. Just a few exercises the, the or what do you indus- think? The fitness industry is has really kind of driven butt exercises to be very linear in nature, right? So it means I'm going to move up and down or I'm going to move forwards and backwards. And those are going to be my movements. So if I'm in a quadruped stance and I'm going to target the glute, I'm going to kick my leg out behind me. They call it donkey kick, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I've and so seen, that would I see those create on a con- uh, TikTok and Instagram. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the that would be, a, we call <laughs> that a concentric action of the muscle. So the oh, muscle God, mean is contracting and it's shortening. Does that make sense? So if you kick your leg back, you'll feel your butt go and Mm -hmm. then it'll come back. So that would be done in one plane of motion, which is great because that's an excellent exercise. But if you, but (laughs) if you look at the butt, it's shaped as a fan, right? So the gluteus muscle itself is fan shaped. It has an attachment to the iliac crest and it comes down. Like a clam kind of. Like a clam, exactly. So it's shaped like that, which means we need to load force into it omnidirectionally, more than one direction, Mm -hmm. right? So a side lunge is a great way to create length to the tissue. So if I'm doing a donkey kick with my foot off the ground, as soon as I put my foot on the ground and I do a lunge in this direction, that's lengthening the tissue, okay? Skaters have big butts. Sounds like choreography Do skaters have big butts? Yeah. You got it. (laughs) I mean, I never looked. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also was a hockey player. So when you squat and then have to drive your foot in an oblique angle, then you're creating when you're force when you're skating mm-hmm. out. That's why hockey players have big butts, yeah. right? They're constantly in a forward flex position. Their pelvis is like this, and they're shooting one leg from side to side, mm-hmm. right? So if you want a big butt, just play hockey. It's true. And that's the big takeaway. <laughs> but we would do a lot of those movements that simulate skating, right? Right. And so we've developed a product called the Viper Pro. Mm-hmm. And the Viper Pro is a free weight. It's like a really elongated medicine ball, if you will. Oh, so okay. it's shaped like a tube. And we developed it to train hockey players. Wow. And so off ice, obviously. Mm-hmm. And and so what we would do is if you were to simulate taking a slap shot with it, so it's a long tube. And if I stimulate taking a slap mm-hmm. shot with it, I'm lengthening that tissue. And at the same time, I'm adding load in this direction, which is going to lengthen and strengthen that muscle. So when we're trying to recover from That's a long-winded way, because he says my answers are long because I'm so passionate about it, it's true. It's a long-winded way of saying that we need to train the glute if you want to maintain shape to it, 
as authentic to the shape that the tissue is. So that that mm. makes sense completely. So you yeah. you do the the so, but you're still advocating to do. We that, would advocate that, to isolate uh, donkey kick and then also integrate. Okay, so we so do both. more than one. Yep, and so we would do them with different loads, at different speeds, and in different directions because that would hit everything, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Right, so we would do it concentrically and we do it eccentrically. Like doing a slow deadlift is great for lengthening the glute muscle and the posterior chain. How the hamstring comes into the glute and then and then mm -hmm. leaves and becomes so the, the glute the muscle. The deadlift itself. is the one where you have that uh, barbell out in front of you or any weights in your hands, and you're basically doing a hinging motion at the pelvis. So you hinge the pelvis back, and that force transmits through the foot, comes up the hamstring, and into the glute. You look at exercise quite differently than I think anyone <laughs> else does. So, but so tell me then. Just I understand the explanation now, which I never thought of it that way at all. The gluteal muscle has a shape like a clam, mm -hmm. and you want to exercise that muscle in all different directions to to hit the whole muscle. To I hit guess, the whole so muscle to and to give it good health, and, and then to get remember the best shape. Because we don't remember, don't forget, we're talking about we're, tra about we're trying to get a really good looking butt. So, and so the organ that creates shape stability is fascia, isn't it? Yes. So fascia responds to different forces at different angles, <coughs> at uh, different speeds, and with different loads. So if I can do that and authentically go, this is what the tissue needs. This is how it is shaped. This is how I'm going to hit it. Bodybuilders have known this forever. Right? They do. If they want a different part of their body to grow, they'll hit it at a different angle, right? And so we do the same thing for cosmetic reasons and for technically, you know, that's bodybuilding. So what would be your, um, would you do, like, let's say you're working on the butt, would you just do the same exercises every time you'd have different exercises or what, what would don't get too complicated okay <laughs> so but the human body loves variability so i never and i bet you gunner and kurt your sons mm -hmm. that have trained with me for like four years they couldn't think of two days we did the same workout yeah, again i know back i asked them and yeah, yeah they're like i don't know what we did today crazy shit that yeah. you do so we want to introduce a lot of variability so Variability might not just be the exercises. It might be the order in which we did the exercises. It might be the rep scheme, how many reps I did. It might be the loads. It might be the directions that I went. All those are constantly changing. Now, if I want to direct force directly to the glute, then you know there's going to be an inventory of exercises that are going to work really well for the glute versus the back, versus the bicep, versus the chest. Yeah, Those are all have different applications of force that we put into it. But if we give it lots of variability, then that's where we get health to the tissue, and and that's where we'll really develop that. So give tissue. me give me five exercises. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they, if you can do that, but give mm -hmm. me like if you've had a BBL, you've invested the money, invested the time, you've gone through surgery, you've gone through your recovery. Now you can work out, mm -hmm. and we know that working out the gluteal area is going to make your result better. Mm -hmm. What would you tell somebody? Say, hey, these are the five exercises you should be doing. Now, obviously, they need to do different loads and mm -hmm. direction and mm -hmm. timing and order and and all those types of things. But just keeping it kind of simple, take away you know home message. Five exercises for your glutes. What well, what would you do? I'll generalize them for you. You should squat. Mm -hmm. You should lunge. Different directions, right? So we're mm -hmm. going to squat in many different directions. You're going to lunge in different directions. So we'll just keep that as that is. We're going to lift things. So mm -hmm. bending down, picking them up. Um, we're going to chop. So chop is moving an object from a high, higher position to like a, a lower chopping position. Wood? Like chopping wood. That so helps your glutes? High to low, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going high to low, and we're going diagonal pattern, right? If you think of the glute all the fibers of it are running at a diagonal a angle, right? Mm -hmm. And then we would go from low to high. Right? What, what does I that need, mean? So I would do a chop going from a low position to a higher position in a diagonal pattern. So I might take an object from here and move it to an object over here, right? So we would go squat, lunge, lift, or deadlift, uh, rotational chop, rotational lift. Uh, so the the rotational chop and the rotational lift. I mean, I've never heard of those exercises or seen them on any uh, 
I don't know, when you see those little pictograms of people <laughs> doing that, maybe it is. I don't well, know. Maybe I missed it. Let's use lacrosse as an example. If you're releasing the ball from a high position to a low position, mm -hmm. technically that's a chop. If you're going from low to high, shooting low and following through high, mm -hmm. that's a rotational lift. But the glute itself, the right glute, crosses through an area of fascia in the lower back called the thoracolumbar fascia, yeah. and it becomes the latissimus dorsi on the other side yeah. of the back, and then it inserts into the opposite arm. Okay, so that so your, you're right, that your right line glute, down. that line, your right glute, the, that's, that's right, your right you glute sing is your <laughs> inserts right to here. Okay, and that's then, the way you think of it. That's the way I think of it. Yeah, because that's how force has to transmit through that tissue. So period yeah I, I so would. that would come up with a totally different set of i mean I, everyone's going to know the squats the lunges the the donkey kick and mm -hmm. things like that that we mm -hmm. see but this chopping motion either from above down or down up mm -hmm. is that to me seems new mm -hmm. so so just tell us how do you do that in the gym then if if for somebody's listening mm -hmm. and they want to know like okay well i i can do the squats but now i realize I have to do multiple different types of squats with different weights and mm -hmm. to, to hit all of those different features that you were talking about. Yeah. And the lunges, they can do forward, sideways, and whatever other type of lunges. Mm -hmm. But with the chop, how do they do the, do the chop? I know you have your, because we have one at home, that the Viper, it, it, yeah. it's a, it looks like a, it's a cylinder with some handles, yeah. but it's it's heavy. Yeah. Is, is that what you, that's one of them. Let's we say you don't have a, a viper. You can use a medicine ball. You so, can use mm -hmm. a cable. You can use a band. So you do all these different Balls things. Also with different tools. Because if I use different tools, that's a different element of variability. Right? So if I use a different tool, that tool has a completely different force profile to it. If you use a band versus free weights. Yeah, okay, totally different. Completely different, right? Yeah. As you stretch a band, the force exponentially and disproportionately increases the further you stress it. Yeah. Now that's important. Because it exponentially increases the force, yeah. But it's disproportionate. So from here to here to here to here to here to here, it's a different level of force. Yeah, that's great because it's variable. It's different. If I use a cable, looks like a band. It's got a handle. It's got a string attached to it. Mm -hmm. But it's free weight. That's going to have a completely different response to it. Mm. So I, I, I'm still a little bit confused as to how I understand now. You're thinking where. You know, as I know the anatomy, the latissimus muscle connects to humerus and goes all the way down. And I can see the line that you're thinking yep. of. I think of them as separate muscles, mm -hmm. but I definitely see what you're thinking in terms of the fascia too. Mm -hmm. Is is really because your body's kind of enveloped in fascia, so yep. it does all connect. So that's why you called it the myofascial junction, right? Yeah. So it's how the muscle connects to the fascia, yes. and how we transmit and produce force body wide. And we do that through different layers. So um, Thomas Myers wrote a really good book. It's one of my all-time favorite books. It's called Anatomy Trains. And he's an anatomist. And he looked at, and many anatomists are doing this. There's some brilliant ones out there. But Tom wrote a really powerful uh, book that kind of changed the way we looked at the fitness industry. And that was looking at when we perform tasks, because that's what the body does. We do tasks. Mm -hmm. We don't do move. We don't do like muscles when we're training. Right. Um, those tasks need to receive force before they ever produce force. But we do that body wide and we do them along lines of stress uh, or lines of force that move through the body. Okay, so so that, he came up with 11 from. different lines in uh, the body. Okay. So there's four arm lines. So lines of stress that are both superficial and deep. So there's two on each. There's the front and the back. Then you have a spiral line that moves through the body like a spiral. You have the deep front line, which is basically really deep musculature that basically houses your internal organs. You have a superficial front line, so that's basically the tissues you see on yeah, the front the side of the body. Yeah, the superficial fascia, right? yeah. yeah. And then you have the posterior back line, or the superficial back line, which is where the glute is part of. It's part of the superficial back line. And then we also have uh, the functional lines. So that's what you see in sport all the time. So a lot of rotational throwers. Good one uh, for to observe is if you watch the track and field championships these uh, last few weeks is the javelin throwers. So the superficial front line is the opposite of, or pardon me, superficial, the front functional line is different than the front functional, or front back, functional back line, sorry. If we're throwing a javelin, that is the opposite of 
the of releasing the javelin. Mm-hmm. So if I take that javelin, I bring it behind me, there's a line of tissue that runs from the inside of your knee, through your groin, through your abdominal wall, through your pec, and into your into your arm this way. The opposite is the back functional line, which is the one we talked about, the glute going yeah. across the lower back. To the left. And that one is observed when we release and follow through. So how we receive forces are different, but it's spread throughout all the myofascial systems. So that, I mean, that's a completely different way of looking at things. Do you, do you, do you want to know a really interesting little side bit here? I absolutely do. I, I used to, in 1984, hold the uh, provincial championship, the record for javelin throw. Did you really? Yeah. Years I need a picture. Yeah, a long time ago. That's amazing. I, I threw I need the fif- proof. 53 meters, I'm sure. Kids I want to see. Throwing them uh, like, you know, 80 meters now. But um, gold medal was. <laughs> Yeah, ninety point six meters or something. Yeah, yeah. So, I just wanted to let you know that you were not at the level. Yeah, it was of terrible. Gold medal. But I, I did. I <laughs> just, no, that's provincial so level. Huge yourself. though. Well, provincial. That's a like, long way to throw a javelin. It's actually. like a fifty level. meters. Is. But um, yeah, but you know, there's only like eight kids competing in the whole of the province. <laughs> it's not a popular sport. But anyway, so okay, so I get all of that. Um, what you described. That's a totally different way of looking at things. But I still want to pin you down Please. on what is the exercise that you're doing to do the chop thing with that. Like, how do you get into that position for your glute? Great question. So can I stand up? Do whatever you like. Okay. So what we might do is let's say I have a cable attached here. Mm-hmm. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my left foot forward which is the outside foot from my cable. Mm -hmm. So from here, as the cable, as I take the cable off, I'm now having a rotational bias. It's rotating me back towards this object. That's lengthening that tissue, okay? Or shortening that tissue. Mm -hmm. As soon as I chop and bring it across here, I'm lengthening lengthening that tissue. So this, this motion here is creating length and contraction to that tissue on my lead leg. Now, if I want to do the other one, I face this way, Cable's still attached here. This one's through. And as I rotate, I'm getting length to this hip. He Sorry, does I have a good butt. <laughs> no, we good. got this going here and back that way. So that way I'm still training that functional lines to create both length and concentric uh, action of the muscle to support the work that you're doing. So it must drive you crazy if you see people working out and they're doing glutes and 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 they have nice glutes and looks like they know what they're doing but you think they could probably be doing something better because most people that you're most likely seeing i'm imagining are going to be the standard kind of squats lunges mm-hmm. you're talking about introducing some really different dynamic movements movement. to yeah. to do that yeah, and absolutely. i think that makes total sense when you think mm-hmm. of the shape of the gluteus muscle yeah and it how you have to, to exercise that. You know, skating yeah. is another one. So yeah. we just do a skater pattern. Yeah. Right? So da- bounding from side to side. As my foot hits the ground, that whole lateral side of the body has to receive that force. Yeah. So it, if I bound further, my own mass enters into the ground and that amount of force is entering into that tissue. Right? So it might be something just as simple as a curtsy squat first. Right? Because that's a lower amplitude lower magnitude of force going into the hip but that way i can lengthen the hip and strengthen it at the same time we might start there right and then we might add into a side lunge to it after that and then you start building out what i call your bubble you have a functional bubble and after re after rehabilitation and introducing you to this stuff the first thing you're going to do is not jump right we would start Mm -hmm. in a stable base and i might just shift your hip there and that might be exercise. And then you work out, uh, work up to it. this is a squat, but we call it, this is a lateral squat, right? And if people don't, aren't quite familiar where they need to go, just touch your bum against the wall, right? And just touch your bum against the wall. And that, because your foot, foot's in the ground, your body will receive that force along the line of stress that you provide it. This is so cool. Who knew we were getting a workout video today? Yeah, I don't know. This is fascinating. (laughs) So I have a question then. Um, Kind of what we did with my little visual aid, warming up the joint. Um, Is there a, a, an, 
exercise regimen or something that patients can do before surgery like i'm talking day of or like right before they get in the car to go that could just That's kind of warm question, everything yeah. up and then can kind of already set up that circulation party um you know are there workouts maybe leading up to surgery like i said even specifically like day of right before you yeah. go that would just better the healing and recovery process yeah i've never thought one of it of that way like, that we yeah we work together <laughs> one of the things that we talked about right off the bat is it's all about preparation is yeah it? Right. So if you are if you are knowing that you're going in for surgery, you should be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's a pretty good reason why if if a hockey player breaks his leg in a game, they're directly off to go get that surgery now, because why would you delay it? Yeah. Right. So same thing in, in preparation for surgery. We want the body to be in its healthiest state so that the body can now repair more efficiently. Right again it's all, always comes down to efficiency mm -hmm. right so it, i believe that if you are going to go and you have made the decision you're making the investment in doing the surgery you should prepare ahead of time mm -hmm. and be as healthy as you possibly mm -hmm. can be as strong as you possibly can because you know recovery is going to be challenging yeah. for you right and we want to set the cellular system up mm -hmm. and to be able to receive that and yeah. be ready to go if you are in a bad place in your life mm -hmm. and then you're trying to do surgery even cognitively mentally emotionally yeah. that's going to make it even more challenging for the f for the physical system the physiological system to mm -hmm. recover so this it all really, comes down to preparation um, this is like a, a lead in for another podcast mm -hmm. uh, or some information i think I th and we've talked about this i think we're, we need to put something together, um, mm -hmm. really, that uses your expertise yeah. and to to prepare patients for surgery. It's another layer of preparation in addition to getting your caregivers and vitamins and mm -hmm. iron and different things like that. Yeah. Diet, this is a completely different other thing that I think needs to be addressed. Yeah, I totally agree with the uh, proper preparation for something like this, something that obviously is so altering to your mind and body. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, um, so for example, a patient going in for a BBL, would it be, you know, how exponentially helpful would it be that morning of to do like a lower body workout or is it better to do yeah, mobility or is it better to do, you know, just stretching versus strength training, you know, or is it all just kind of gonna be good to go that'll just kind of help that recovery process yeah because surgery is traumatic mm -hmm. you would want to be as relaxed as you possibly mm -hmm. could be if you're going in and and exercising and then requiring the nervous system to have to recover that and also mm -hmm. have to recover from the surgery that's a lot yeah right because as we know you're subservient to the forces that you're put under and right. so the nervous system um it will always find the most um, it kind of has like a, a, a rule of what's the highest level of threat. Yeah. And let's deal with that first. Mm -hmm. Right. So exercising, stretching, all that stuff probably isn't going to matter day of mm -hmm. other than, you know, make sure you fuel ahead of time okay. because, mm -hmm. you know, you're probably not going to feel like eating a whole lot over the next couple of days, but mm -hmm. you know, you're going to need some fuel sources and good nutrients to help yeah. enhance that. Um, you probably want to have lots of collagen in your system. Mm -hmm. So if you're a meat eater, that's going to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. If you're not a meat eater, you're going to have to start to find ways that you can get collagen into your body. Because the only way you can, the body will make collagen. Uh -huh. But if you have an abundance of it, yeah, then the body has has collagen to be able to pull from, and it's less stressful on the cellular system. Is this to one? And like, I don't know if this is uh, something that is just exists for other people to make money. But these collagen supplements is that legitimate? Is that something that patients can take? You know, before that would just kind of aid in that process. Or I, is I the don't know collagen enough about like it to answer that? I don't know, John. Do you Mo have an opinion on that? Most supplements for collagen, if you aren't actually getting bone collagen mm -hmm. right in there. Um, is basically in the form of gelatin when gelatin itself is is basically collagen that's been ground ground up okay and you know water's been removed from it okay and then now you have an actual mm. structure that you can use so there are supplements that help with that oh, okay i wasn't sure but if i mean it was all bone just broth like is your is, is a great way of getting collagen into your body i hear it's gross though is it soup like but yeah i've heard it do you like soup i do like soup okay so chicken noodle soup is bone broth oh okay yeah so if you eat chicken noodle soup, you're getting the, you'll kind of see there, it looks like there's, 
when you let it settle, it kind of looks like there's a little bit of layer mm -hmm. of fat. It kind of looks a little different. Yeah, it's not yeah, pure yeah. liquid, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That's hyaluronic acid, mm -hmm. which is the makeup of collagen. Mm -hmm. So it's important to ingest that because mm -hmm. the more hyaluronic acid that you have and to eat it while you're recovering as well mm -hmm. is and make it part of my skincare routine. And yes. Just <laughs> so I guess mothers are correct with uh, making chicken little soup and yeah. we're, we're sick. Yep, yeah, 100%. Because you get so many nutrients into it and it's going to boost the immune system. So, Wow, see, it's all connected. It is. That's so, that's so cool. John, I, this has been yeah. absolutely fantastic. Is there anything you want to add, you know, that you just think, you know, in your expertise would be helpful for future patients or maybe patients even going through the recovery process right now that they can incorporate into that? that would yeah, just, well, I you know, love you really guys so that. much. I, I want to be able to help your listeners. So, um, you know, have them, they can direct message me through Instagram. What uh, is your, what's your social it's media? Authentic Health Coach at Authentic Health Coach. And so they can direct message me if they Authentic have any other questions. Authentic health coach. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they can send me a direct message on that. And uh, and we'll put together some programming for you guys so you can give to your listeners so that they can access it. So I'll, I'll awesome. build up some programs. Are you going to have social them. media when you're on your uh, cruises? Do you tell us about your... Uh, <laughs> your yacht. Uh, what are you doing with yeah, that? So doing I'm with the Ritz wellness Carlton, consult. Right? Yeah, I'm the well wellness consultant for the Ritz Carlton's new yacht collection. Oh, wow. So I build out all the experience that's going to happen on the on the yacht. <laughs> train the coach, get them ready to go, and humble and brag. Have them, wow, have them that's fun. amazing. Yeah, so I'm I'm excited because being a prairie boy it's pretty weird to be involved in the yachting industry yeah you're going to yeah. these luxurious lot yes. yachts all over the the world but yeah that, i mean that's pretty cool that yeah. they reached out to you and obviously they're trying to do something different that's and, right um and we're trying to create a movement experience for them that's different you know ritz yeah. carlton wants to be known as and they are known as being a very luxury brand and yeah you wouldn't just want anybody to come and go oh yeah i do that with my personal trainer we want right. to create mm -hmm. an experience that enhances the rest of their trip yeah because i guarantee you nobody's coming to the ritz carlton yacht to work out yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> right <laughs> it's just they're gonna do a workout because yeah. hey i love working out <clears throat> but it, you're basing it all on this whole movement i mean the, mm -hmm. the working out has changed so much over yeah. the years and and i think you're just on the forefront of this with with your movement and, and i certainly experienced it firsthand well so. i've had i've had a lot of great mentors over my life um there's a lot of brilliant people in this industry um you know when we look at how the body functions is very different from what we were taught in school mm -hmm. and when i went to university back when the pterodactyls flew around the earth <laughs> um the way we looked at movement was a little bit different. Now it's evolving and there's some really great stuff. I'm fortunate enough to build education for coaches yeah. um, on our, at the Institute of Motion. We have a, a course called the Applied Health and Human Performance Specialist Certification. Um, well, and you travel all over teaching, don't you? I mean. Yeah, prior to cool. COVID, I, I, I think I in 2017, I lapped the world like three times. Yeah. Coaching. Well, yeah. just getting out fun. the message and, and yeah. explaining to things. I mean, it's valuable. Yeah. John, thank you so much yeah, thank for you. being here. And it was now really it's fantastic. For our favorite part, and I'm sure you've uh, heard of the OG wheel. Now you I get have. to see her. So, guys, it's <laughs> nice. time for the OG wheel. Let's see the OG wheel. What What is she What are we going to get today? today? I am hoping for the TikTok. Yes, you're always well, hoping for the TikTok. It's, it'll be cute and fun, and it's, all, it's easy. Yeah. Well, you're good at dancing so oh, thank you i'm sure you like the tiktok Me? I, I don't not TikTok so much. like that though huh i don't tiktok like that you don't i don't honestly my money don't because no jiggle, one's paying jiggle. me to do it <laughs> i heard somebody uh, on tiktok the other day said uh people asked her how do you make money on tiktok like if the, and she's like uh duh i watch tiktok while i'm at work yeah. <laughs> oh, well. all right let's uh see what we're gonna get today OG Chef. OG Chef. OG Chef's going to make an appearance well, today. I think so. We haven't seen the OG Chef in a this minute. This is the OG Deli. All my BBLs come with Has hips. anyone seen no hips? the OG Next. Chef? Next. Are we really doing Can the OG you, uh, Chef you today? On the menu? I think you have oh, more I'm internal fat than I do. So excited. I'm going to see if I can find him. All right. Um, somebody get the OG Chef here, please. Are we really doing Has the anyone OG seen the OG Chef? All right. No? All right, I hear we found I love that the OG yeah. chef. Way to yeah, show yeah. up. Yeah, I guess you guys summoned me with that stupid uh, Will William on here. Look at his dumbass face on there. So I was listening to this podcast. Yeah. 
And uh, I don't know, this guy seems to work out a lot, know a lot about the exercise. You're missing salami, though. How does that fit in to the whole uh, workout uh, pre... Protein. Yeah, Snack. is that got Fuel. collagen in it? Can you eat the salami? Is that got collagen? Or Yeah, the casing certainly does. Yeah. Right? And then all the component parts of the fat is wrapped in collagen. God, this so guy yeah. gets technical real yeah. fast, doesn't he? Does. he? He's smart. Well, my yeah. This guy will go down a rabbit hole in a <laughs> second. My wife's grandmother or grandfather was a butcher, so... Uh, know so you know meat. about the salami? I know about salami. What yeah. about the mustard? Do you think that's helpful for recovery? You cannot have a sausage without mustard. <laughs> so it's good, though. But nutritionally... Yes. And her dad planted mustard seeds, so... Why are we talking about this guy? I don't know. Also, sounds like you should have started a deli. What's, go, what's going on? What happened here? The guy knows a lot about deli. I like it, though. I know, I know. So you would recommend eating the salami before surgery and after Probably surgery? Probably not for you. Almost exclusively. <laughs> well, not for yeah. William. It's that not, not going to turn out well for you. The is a salami sandwich. He comes into my deli. <laughs> no, I but tell no, him, hey, I mean, like, if the patient the is line, even buddy. eating salami, you know, <laughs> it carries with it a little bit of odor, so... Well, Listen, OG Chef, I have a question for you since uh, you... I was just about to leave. Go on. No, I just about to, to do. You were fashionably late to yeah. the show, so yeah. you're well, going to hang out. I got stuff to do. I'll do the little uh, like make a sandwich podcast stuff that you guys get up to. All right. a real job. Well, part of your real job is answering this real question. Can you tell me which type of food is stolen the most all over the world? This is multiple choice. Stolen. So I'll give you some answers, unless you want to just take a guess right out of the sky. Well, I probably know it, but go on. Shoot. Okay. Tell you me. can do... A, slices of American cheese. No. B, cheese, regular, all other types of cheese. C, protein bars. Or D, chocolate bars. American cheese, the rest of the cheese, protein bars or chocolate bars. Yeah. A, it's a stupid question. But B, of course, there has to be chocolate bars. Ain't nobody stealing no American cheese. That's not even cheese. I don't use no. that in my deli. You, you're you're saying chocolate bars. straight, pure mozzarella. <laughs> yeah. That's what I use. Buffalo Swiss mozzarella. cheese. Yeah, yeah, I don't get into the buffalo too much. I use I use a different mo mozzarella. I can't get into it. Go on. Oh, I will go on because I yeah. love this part. And it's me telling you that you're wrong. <laughs> uh, I can't believe that, because, Gabby. And you I'm, know what? I can. The answer is maple syrup. <laughs> Well, what the is answer it? is cheese. You'd think it'd be alcohol, canned goods, or something that comes in small packaging like condiments, mustard, or spices. But no, the most stolen food in the world is cheese. Can, um, I, have a, can I give you a question? Go yeah? for it. Do you pay someone to write these questions? Because no, you, do, you know what's funny? You Dr. William does. <laughs> Dr. William pays question. somebody. Oh, what do we think the most? Help anyway. What do we think the most stolen type of cheese is? What's your favorite type of cheese? You say mozzarella? No, not mozzarella. I don't know. I like all types of Tellagio. I probably put me down for Tellagio. I have a little brie moment. Yeah, brie's good. It's overrated. Though. It's overdone. I like the Tellagio. Okay. Smells are you gonna bad. Are you gonna Tastes make us good. a little charcuterie board one of these days with all the salami? I don't cheeses? mess with that stuff. I'm literally two pieces of bread. You got the salami, the mustard. Slap them together. I gotta go. I don't have all day to be on your little. Uh, well, guys, TikTok I thing. would not the recommend. Exercise guru here, <laughs> yeah. over here. Guy, the guy's got more ta more tattoos than I've uh, seen in a, in a while. There, but it looks good. All right, you guys enjoy your little uh, podcast thing. Thanks, and we'll OG talk to Chef. You later. Thanks, Chef. Hey, you know what, OG Chef? Thank you so much for joining us and all of your insight. I wouldn't recommend hiring him as your personal chef. Doesn't sound like you're going to get much on that sandwich. But John, thank you so much for all the insight, all the thank information. This has been so cool. I've learned so much today. I can't wait to go home and do so many dynamic movements and exercises <laughs> now. Um, but really, thank you so much for joining us. Guys, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, ask us questions, follow us, listen to the episodes, hang out, learn along with us. John, thank you. Dr. William, Thanks, wherever you are, thank you. OG Chef, maybe no thank you. But until next time, guys, thank you so much much for joining us on this episode of Behind the Mask. I'm Gabby Allen and we will see you next time. You're about to experience Behind the Mask, the podcast. podcast.